Though their eyes have been opened, sometimes they don't see everything just right. I want to preach on one of the greatest needs of my church. I don't know about yours. God has given us one of the fastest growing churches in East Tennessee of any denomination. God has filled up our building. We built a balcony. It's packed out. Now the cold and cheers are out. They're packed out. But the problem I'm having with my people is getting them to see the need to refocus on what's really important in life. We are so sidetracked with everything that's in front of us. Everywhere you go, there's a screen, there's a television, there's a movie, there's an advertisement, there's a cell phone, there's a computer. There is something constantly entertaining our minds. And though we don't mean for it to happen over a period of time, it affects our focus and our crispness, if that's the right word, on our real Christianity. I think my church needs to refocus, and I'm sure if we took a survey, it would probably be true in every church represented here. But the second touch gave him clarity and focus. Oh, what a difference our churches would have next Sunday if God would just touch us one more time. Could it be that another word for revival would just be to simply get refocused again? All of us have to fight this on a daily basis. Staying drilled in on what's really important concerning the Scripture. If we were to take a spiritual evaluation of the eyesight of this church in general as a whole, I wonder what your reading would be. Because the Bible says in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 22 that the eye affects the heart. The way people see things as a church affects the heart of the church. Because if I remember correctly, Proverbs chapter 29 says, where there is no vision, people still perish. I wonder if any of us here from whatever church we're from, I wonder if any of us could really stand up and say, when is the last time the local congregation as a whole got a fresh glimpse of what's really important in life? You know, as you get older, priorities change, man. It, I'm getting old. I, I remember when I first got saved, older people stand up and say, pray for me, my back hurts. And somebody stand up and say, pray for me and my shoulders. And I think, man, won't you sit down and shut up? This ain't a nursing home, it's a church. You're going to say something, brag on Jesus, quit belly aching about everything you don't like. But now somebody stands up and says, pray for me, my back hurts. I'm thinking, I got that. And another will stand up and say, my shoulders. And I say, I got that. I've learned to love those people, you understand me? Because as you, as you get older, your priorities change. It ought to be that way in our life spiritually. As we get older in the Lord, not only as an individual, but as a congregation and as an assembly, our priorities ought to change. It ought to be more focused on spiritual things, if that's putting it correctly. So I want to tell you some things that I want to be refocused on. See if you need to do the same thing, and, and we'll be done with the service. Number one, I think we need to be refocused when it comes to having compassion for people that are lost. It's amazing to me how we're content to not see people get saved in our churches. Man, the night I got saved, 13 people got saved that night. And if you took the people that had been shot, drunk, abortion, been in prison, or drunks, or dope addicts, there might have been two people standing there. And it was nothing to see 13 people get saved. Did you know the average church I go in now, I asked them, how many people have been saved a year? Some of them are telling me, none. No salvations in a year. Nobody getting baptized. Nobody joining the church. And the last thing Jesus ever said to his disciples before he ascended back up to heaven was to evangelize the world and get the gospel to everybody. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. Then why have we lost our vision and become content with nobody getting saved? I was preaching in Texas and uh, they had an altar here. It was made out of wood. It kind of looked like this pew, but it was I could tell it was just sitting on the floor. And I preached my heart out on hell. The reality of hell, people dying without God, burning in the wrath of God, suffering the vengeance of God. Our family's going to hell, we need to get a burden. We stood for invitation. People were playing with their hair, getting their car keys out, looking at their phones. Nobody paid any attention to anything I'd even said in the service. Well, it fired me up. I have to tell you, it fired me up. So you know what I did? There was a door right there that led outside. 
I grabbed that altar, I drug it over to the door, I opened the door, and I threw it out in the parking lot and shut the door behind me. Oh, everybody's looking at me now. <laughs> everybody's looking at me now. I said, you know what I just did? And one of the men yelled out, you threw the altar out. I said, no, I didn't. I threw out a piece of furniture. You threw the altar out a long time ago when a man can preach on hell, and it doesn't even burden us and break our hearts enough to get us to weep for those that don't know God. I think we need to get refocused on the fact that people still burn in hell right. if they die without God. Right. I was preaching to me in Mississippi, and there's a mean little boy come in. I knew he was mean. When he walked in the door, I knew he was mean. They picked him up on a church van, and both knees was out of his blue jeans. He was 10 years old. I'll never forget him. His hair was so greasy it looked wet. He had no shoestrings in his tennis shoes. And his t-shirt looked like it had been wadded up for a week or two in a floor somewhere. He stunk. He was 10 years old and he rode the to to church. And there's 300 people there that morning. And they put this kid on the front row. Well, man, you know you put kids like that on the front row. They're going to tear the service all to pieces. He don't know nothing about God. So about five minutes before church, he's yakking around and trying to make airplanes out of pages out of the songbook. I, I just knew I was in trouble. So I went over there and I sat down beside him. I said, uh, I'm going to ask you something. I said, did you know a man named Phil Kids preaching today? He said, yeah, that's what I heard. I said, uh, have you ever met him? He said, no, I don't know him. I said, you better watch yourself now. I said, you ever heard of Billy the Kid? He said, oh, yeah, he killed people. I said, this is his nephew. <laughs> I said, I, mean, I don't know what I had to do, man. He said, I'll tell you, this is what he did. He said, I'll tell you one thing. He ain't going to have no problem out of me. <laughs> Had a little greasy hair fellow sit right there and never took his eyes off. I preached that morning to the church that God was on his throne and he could do anything and save anybody. Hey. When I got done preaching, I was soaking wet and I put my pop coat on and I was walking across the front of the church and something snagged my coat. I thought I got caught on the communion table. I turned around and there stood that little old greasy haired boy with the back of my coat in his hand. And where the clear tears had run down his dirty cheeks and made two clear trails all the way down his cheeks. And I turned around, his name was BJ. I said, son, what's wrong with you? He said, sir, I'm not saved. And he said, I've not, I've not been in church. My mom and daddy don't go to church. I don't have any money. I don't have anything. No shoelaces in his tennis shoes. And he said, I don't know how to be saved. The pastor said, let me get one of the altar where I said, no, I'm not this on myself. Just leave me alone. And I sat down on the altar with a little greasy-haired 10-year-old boy. Hey. I took my Bible and I led him to Jesus. When he got there, I asked to Jesus to save him. I showed him some verses in the Bible about repentance and faith. And I got up to walk away and my coat snagged again. I turned around and he's got the back of my coat again. I said, son, you just got saved. You can't lose it that fast. So if you got it, you're okay. And I didn't know the story. And when I said that, the piano player broke down and fell across the ivories and began to cry out loud. There's 300 people in the building. And I knew someone right. And I said, son, well, what's wrong? What are you crying about? He said, it's no secret. My daddy's the dr town drunk in this town, and everybody in this building knows it. My daddy's a wanderer. And the reason why I don't have strings in my tennis shoes and my hair is dirty and my clothes are wrinkled is because my daddy ran off. He's late drunk for months. Mama works at a little greasy spoon restaurant down here to keep us from starving. She said a couple of months ago she finally got up enough money to go down to the Salvation Army and buy some used furniture where we wouldn't have to sleep in the floor no more. She said, Daddy come home in a drunken stupor and tore all the furniture out, took all the money out of Mom's purse and beat my mom. And I ain't seen my daddy in months. But you told all these people that God can save anybody. And I want you to tell me in front of all these people that God's going to save my daddy. I said, well, son, I, I, I don't know about your daddy. He said, but you told them God could save anybody. I said, yeah, but that's before I heard this story. I don't even know who your daddy is. I, I, we don't even know where he's at. We can't find him. What do you mean, your daddy? He said, but you said God was on his throne. And I want God to save my drunk daddy. Man, that broke my heart. Six months went by, and I was preaching immediately about 45 minutes down the road. We'd already stood up here and we were singing the opening song. 
And the little fella come running in the back. He had on a white shirt and a black tie and black pants, shiny shoes, and a big Bible under his arm. And instead of taking a seat, the little brat ran right up on the platform and grabbed me and hugged me. I said, son, I'll be glad to hug you, sign your Bible after church, whatever, but you need to go sit down. Church has already started. And he looked up at me and said, you don't even know me. I said, no, I don't, but I'll be glad to meet you after church. Get you a seat. He said, I'm BJ. I didn't recognize him. The first thing that went through my mind, I knew how mean he was. I said, did you steal a car to get here? That, that's what it is. It's a 45-minute ride. You're 10 years old. Did you steal the car to get here? And he never said a word. He pointed to the back door and he walked the man with his arm around his wife and Bibles in their hands. And he said, Daddy wanted to drive out here and say thank you for praying for him. Because, Dad... God saved my daddy and my mama and put our home back together again. And now i got a Christian mom and dad. And brother kid, you tell everybody God is on the throne. And he still loves sinners. And it doesn't matter how messed up you are. It doesn't matter where you've been and what you've done. Oh, God help us to get refocused that God still saves sinners. Amen. Can y'all hear me in the back? Okay. <laughs> Compassion for sinners. Number two, I think we need to get refocused on just being concerned about each other. Did you know church is a community? A community is people that help each other. We rush in, have church, and rush out, and most of us don't even know each other's name. And when somebody in the church hurts, everybody in the church ought to hurt with them. Paul said, I laugh with them that laugh, I weep with those that weep, and I rejoice with those that rejoice. We need to get back in contact with knowing and loving each other. Just caring about the local assembly. You know, the Bible, the Bible calls the church a body. Let me tell you what happens to the body. If you take a hammer and hit your thumb accidentally, the rest of your body don't start cussing your thumb. The rest of your body automatically does everything it can to try to relieve the hurt. The other hand will start rubbing you may even put it under your arm. You'll hold it up over your heart. You'll do everything you possibly can because the body's responding to one member that's hurting. See, that's why God called us a body. When we are inside a community of a local church, we need to realize there's people in our church that are hurting. I got women that come to my church that live with drugs. And they come by themselves year after year. I got people in my church, their son is in prison for the rest of their lives for murder. I got people in my church that their daughter, their dope addicts, they haven't seen them in years. 22 years since they've seen their daughter and she's living on the street. They don't even know she's dead or alive. People are hurting. And when our focus is right, when we come into church, we just don't rush in, shake everybody's hand, God bless you, and rush out. We go to those that we know that are hurting and we do everything we can to try to comfort them and try to minister to them. I want a couple to Jesus in a church several years ago. And they were mean and wicked. They were crazy, I tell you. And they got saved. And they were living together. And of course, when you get saved, you stop that nonsense. And they got married like they're supposed to. And so they came to the church for a while. And I came back the next year. And I went to one of the deacons of the church. I said, a year ago, I led a man and a woman to Jesus here. Their lives were messed up. They got married. He said, oh, yeah, they came. That's what he said. He said, they came faithful for six months. I said, six months? I said, so they've been gone for several months. He said, yeah. I said, by the way, what was their name? He said, Lord, I don't, I don't know. I couldn't tell you. I don't know they ever heard. I said, you mean to tell me two new converts that God saved and turned their lives around came to this church for six months, and as a deacon, you don't even know their names? No wonder they left. No wonder they didn't feel like they fit in, that they were loved and accepted. Can you imagine going to a church for six months and not even knowing the new convert's names? But that's how this, it's awful quiet in here, by the way, but that's how disconnected we are. We come in with so much on our mind, we flop down in our pew, we listen to the man of God preach a great message, we shake his hand, we go right back out in the car, and we don't even stop to think about that lady that just married her husband. Or that man that found his son dead with suicide. And all of these are real problems. Why don't you take time and let God, why don't you start the ministry of just caring for people? Sending somebody a card. Saying a nice word. 
saying, look, life may be tough, but I'm praying for you. We're glad you're here today. I want to be known as the friendliest church in Tennessee. I tell my people, you sit down before you shake every hand in this building, we'll church you! Because it doesn't cost you anything to be nice. It doesn't cost you anything to be friendly! I was preaching in, uh, outside of Winston Salem. We had about 1,400 people a night coming. Man, the Bible broke out. It was great. And I preached a little simple message about just taking time out to say hello to people. Do you notice before church, I went up and down the aisles, hey, how you doing? Thank you for coming. That didn't cost me anything. You didn't have to be here tonight. So being kind is a, is a gesture all of us should be able to do. And there were two little girls that came in, and I knew one of them was in the Christian school at the church. And I went by and I said, hey, young ladies, thank you for being here tonight. God bless you. And 1,400 people, you know, you got to stay pretty active to get all that in. When we stood for invitation, the one little girl reached over and grabbed the girl that went to the Christian school by the hand, and I watched her lips. She said, come pray with me. She was 15 years old. She brought her to the altar. They prayed together. One of the workers talked to her. And they stood her up. And when they stood her up, she did something I'd never seen before. Fifteen years old. She reached in her purse and got a piece of paper and threw it on the altar. Well, being a preacher, I thought, well, I wonder what's on that note. <laughs> and so I told the preacher, I said, that girl just threw a note down there. You might want to read it. I have no idea what it is or right? who she is. She was fifteen years old. And her girlfriend that went to the Christian church at school invited her to revival. 15. I had no idea of her story. I didn't know where she came from. When it opened up the note, the little girl was still standing there, and the preacher said, Honey, can I read this out loud? And she said, Yes, go ahead. And it was a suicide note. She had wrote that note at 5 o'clock that evening. I'm killing myself tonight. I am hurt so bad. My life is so broken. Mom and dad split up. They were living in projects. It was awful. And she said, I'm ending my life tonight. She wrote that at 5 o'clock. And when she got done writing the note, this little girl said, the Lord told me to call you and invite you to revival meeting. She'd never been to a revival meeting. She came in. She was nervous. She didn't know she'd be accepted. She didn't know if anybody would know her or not. And she said, preacher, when you walked by me and said, hello, thank you for being here. She said, my heart opened up and said, somebody really wants me. Somebody really cares about me. And she said, had you not said that to me and that girl not called me on the phone and invited me to this revival, I'd be dead in hell right now because it's 830. I'd be in hell by now. And there's a little girl that her life is being put together. They got the money together in tuition. They put her in a Christian school. And now she wants to go to Bible college and love God and live God for all of us. You don't, you don't want to just somebody being nice to somebody. Now look, if you're looking for perfect people to join the church, you can forget it, because I'm telling you, this world's going to hell in a handbasket, and people are screwed up when they come. I don't even ask people if they're married. Nobody gets married anymore. Everybody's living together. It's his kids, her kids, their kids, and somebody else's that they dropped off. I had a woman drop off two kids in my church parking lot a year and a half ago. She's never been back to pick them up. I've had them a year and a half. And when people come in, they're going to have tattoos. And they're in the prison. And they live in trailer parks. And they have no windows. And the doors are broken down. And there's beer cans out in the yard. And there's a shaggy dog on the porch. And their lives are really messed up. And that's exactly where we would be had it not been for the grace of Almighty God. And they're looking for somebody that loves them. Amen. Had a man walk in my church not long ago with a big staff. Well, I'm so controversial. You, you're not walking in our church with a staff. So my security team grabbed him and said, sir, you're welcome here, but the staff's got to go now. I said, we don't put up with that here. He said, I'm going to tell you why I'm here. That man saw me in the store the other day and he pointed to me. He said, that man invited me to church and told me he'd pray for me. That man right there. He said, I just served 39 years in prison for murder. And I can't believe that somebody would love me after I've lived such a wicked life. He got saved and baptized, and he sits on the front row. He's one of the best people I got. You know what made a difference? Somebody cared. Somebody. When's the last time you just reached out to somebody, invited somebody, and tried to be nice? 
If we don't get refocused and get back to what really built our churches, we're going to lose them. Let me give, let me give you this. I got to hurry. I get paid by the hour, and I've only got 30 minutes, so I've got to, I've got to hurry. <laughs> Number three, we've got to get refocused on being consistent and faithful to God. We should not have to wonder whether you're going to be in church on Sundays or Wednesdays, whenever you have it. And we should live such a dedicated life that if we don't show up, people would know there's something wrong. The average Christian is a, is a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. They show, but you can't depend on them. You remember this, Brother Dr. Atkins. You're only one, situ one situation away from losing what you think is your best people. We're living in a society where there's no commitment to our jobs, no commitment to our marriages, and there's no commitment to our churches anymore. There's no commitment to the job, man. There's help wanted signs all over. I don't know if it's like that here. People are looking for folks to help. What are these fat, lazy guys doing, man? What, how are they living? Who's paying their bills? I don't know what's going on. I've never seen this country like this before. They blame up and let the government take care of them, and they don't even want to get out of bed anymore. And so there's no consistency or commitment to the job. They go to a job, there's one thing about the job they don't like, they don't even tell the boss they're leaving. They just walk off and quit, never come back. I know I've owned 19 businesses. I've seen it so many times. Marriage is the same way. I remember when I got married, we were taught you work through your problems. Daddy said you made your bed hard sleep in it. You old timers remember that? We were so old fashioned when we got married, we said till death do us part. You remember that? You can't get anybody to say that now. So I married my wife 46 years ago and I told her, I said, don't you ever say divorce. We're not even talking about divorce in this house. And I can tell you 46 years later, we've never said the word divorce. Now, murder? <laughs> but people think no more now about signing the divorce paper than they do about rolling the rolling toilet paper. There's no commitment to marriage anymore. And you know I'm telling the truth. The problem is that philosophy has now drifted in our churches. Yeah. There's no commitment to the church. This younger generation, if we don't get plugged in and start changing something, when we die off our generation, our churches are going to be empty. There is a disconnect with the next generation coming on because they're not committed to anything. 50% of my church is not even a member of my church. They would die for me. They never miss. They tithe, but they won't even join because they don't want that step of commitment. But we've got to get refocused as the people of God. We've got to be committed to the local assembly. We've got to be faithful. We've got to have courage to stand. i tell you this. I'm not out of time, but <clears throat> uh, during the COVID thing, uh, every church in our county, every church in, in Northeast Tennessee, you know, where I'm from, shut down. I went against that. Every pastor needed to obey the Holy Ghost. We're independent churches, they can do what they want, but I haven't got television ever really. So I said, look, I'm going to have service. If you want to come, fine. If you don't, I fully understand it. You take care of yourself. Make sure you stay healthy. So I didn't know if anybody would be there. So I got to church the next Sunday. You couldn't get in the building. People were hanging out in the windows. People were everywhere. Because every church had shut down, and people wanted to go to church and had nowhere to go. So we never did shut down. <clears throat> well, all the big churches in, in, in my county and surrounding county got together and got mad because we didn't shut down. Because their people were calling them and saying, look, Emmaus is open. How come we're not open? So yeah. started putting a bunch of pressure on me. So a bunch of preachers got a petition together and sent it to me telling me I need to close my church down. <laughs> you don't need to do that to me. And so I ignored the letter. I didn't answer it. And so it wasn't long until I got a letter from the governor's office. And he said, I want you to know that all the churches in your area have closed. This COVID thing's out of hand. It's going to kill everybody. You're murdering your people. You need to shut your church down. I can't believe you still have the doors open to your church. You're supposed to be a man of God. I mean, I heard all this nonsense. Yes. So I tried to be patient. They wrote me another letter threatening me. So I called the sheriff because they were going to arrest me. And I told the county sheriff, I said, if you want to come and arrest me, you're going to have to. I got an attorney. I got a bailiff set up, set up at the jail. But I said, you are poking the wrong puppy. Because if you think I'm afraid of you, you are out of your ever-loving mind. So I got another letter from the governor's office. So I just called Nashville. I said, now listen to me very carefully. Don't you ever write me another letter and tell me to shut it down. Don't you ever threaten me again. I'm on television in 10 stations in 73 countries. So if you want your state troopers to come in, I'm going to film every one of them and put them live on television. So you send all the state troopers you want down here. 
The county sheriff called me and said, Preacher, I've never put a man in jail for preaching, and I'm not going to put you in jail. You go ahead and preach. Now, I can't have those state troopers. That's from the governor. I said, well, you tell them, to send anybody they want. We'll have a party. But they are going on national television. So I wrote them back, and this is what I said to the governor. I dare you tell me to shut down my church. When every abortion clinic in Tennessee is still open, every Walmart is still open, every liquor store is still open, every drug addict is still pipping their drugs, every strip club in this state is still open, and you had the audacity to tell me to shut down the church. As long as the liquor stores are open and you're slaughtering babies in the abortion clinic, you're wasting your time. I will never shut this church down. Amen. So I thought everybody would get behind me. That's how dumb I was. <laughs> they called me Monday morning and people had come down from the community surrounding my church and shot all of our windows out with nine millimeter pistols. Left all the casings in the parking lot. Shot out all the windows in my my, my buildings, my fellowship halls went all the way around the church, shot out everything. They did it on a Monday morning. I got on the internet, I got on Facebook, I said, you don't want to miss this Sunday! I'm preaching on who pulled the trigger and shot the windows out of the house of God. That place was overflowed. An hour and a half before church, you could not get in the building. And I said, you know who shot the windows out? A dirty, rotten, yellow belly coward that wouldn't dare come on this campus when he knew I was here. He had to wait till a Monday morning because I knew he wasn't here. I said, you yellow belly coward, why don't you come down here on a Sunday morning? I'll meet you in the parking lot, and when I get done with you, you won't shoot out another window. Fire was flying everywhere. Our phone lines lit up. They threatened to kill me, kidnap my wife, rape my grandkids. They started digging a grave behind my church and put a marker on it and said, rest in peace, Phil Kidd. But I'm telling you, we've got to get back to having some guts about us. I didn't want to fight. I just wanted to be able to preach the gospel. Are you listening to me? We have got to get back to being courageous. We've got to get back to being consistent. We've got to get back to having courage. We've got to get back to having concern for each other, compassion for sinners. And in closing, the one that bothers me the most, we've got to do something about getting our kids in. Yeah. I, I, I don't know where you guys go to church, you ladies, but we're losing a whole generation. I'm talking about the whole thing is gone. Did you know 75% of all kids raised in church quit church after they leave home and graduate from school? Did you know the average college student only goes to church three months after they start college? I tell you what I'm seeing in my church. Church kids are walking out on the street and street kids are trying to get in to get into church. For some reason, we're losing our next generation. And if we don't wake up and start preaching serious gospel, I'm going to tell you my temptation in our church, and we're not going to bow to it, by the way, is they want to come in here with all this hoopla of music and turn the lights off and have these smoke machines on our platform and have a bunch of singers that look like they need spray dipped in worm. I'm telling you, I'm not putting up with that bunch of nonsense. They want to throw the Bible out. We got men wanting to dress like women and women wanting to dress like men. We got kids that don't even know what they are. This is the biggest mess America has ever known. And if we've ever needed a preacher of holiness and godliness and righteousness, the Bible said Noah was a preacher of righteousness. We've got to get back to preaching on holy living, being separated from the world, and dedicated unto our God. I don't know what you're going to do this year, but I'll tell you what I'm going to do with the help of Jesus. I'm going to ask him to help me get refocused on the things that really matter in my life. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. And our players come and thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you so much. Take the time out of your Monday night schedule just to encourage me. Oh God. So I got a question for you, and really I'm asking me. My wife and I joined hands and had prayer for this meeting before I left, and I said to her, I don't ever want spiritual things to become mechanical to me. I'm as serious about this meeting as any meeting I've ever preached in my life. Because I believe God's people of all ages need to get refocused. And you know I'm telling it right. You can tell me about your church, I guarantee you tell me the same thing I preached tonight. But why don't you let the difference start with you? Why don't you be the one that steps up and says, you know what, I'm going to get anointed. 
I'm going to get the power of the Holy Ghost on my life. I'm going to let God touch me and let me be the one that starts revival where I'm at in my church. So while our heads are bowed, the pianos play, and I want to ask you a question. If I did give an invitation, if I did, could you even come? If I gave you a chance to come forward and hit the reset button, hit the reset button with your Christian life, would you even come? Or are you so far gone it doesn't really even matter anymore? Heavenly Father, I've tried to say what you wanted me to say. I I know in my life, every once in a while, I just kind of let the Holy Ghost fall on me fresh and new and give me power, give me boldness, give me compassion. And there's good people in this building, good people, but probably good people that need to be refocused as well. We're seeing things blurry, Lord, but it ought to be bright and crisp, and I want you to forgive us. Help us to get back to seeing and doing what's really important. Our heads are bowed. If I gave an invitation, would you even come? Would it even matter to you? Or is this just another service you can chop up that you were at? Would you even come? Moments. If you want to come up here and pray, 